Disclaimer. This instructional video is prepared for professional medical practitioners undertaking clubfoot deformity treatment and care in babies and children. Clubfoot treatment is a specialized medical intervention and should only be undertaken by medical professionals specifically trained and skilled in the technique and licensed by the appropriate legal and medical regulatory bodies in their jurisdiction. Hello, my name is Dr. Norgrove Penny and the title of this video is Why the Ponsetti Method Works, looking at the kinematics of the tarsal bones and the subtalar joint. Now we know that the Ponsetti method of manipulation and casting works and works very effectively and very efficiently and has dramatically changed the way we treat clubfoot deformity in babies. But why does it work so effectively when we've tried so many other techniques in the past that have failed? What is so different about this method of manipulation and casting compared to other techniques that we have used in the past? Now, Dr. Ponsetti, in his book in 1996, made the following quote. A well-conducted orthopedic treatment based on a sound understanding of the functional anatomy of the foot and on the biological response of young connective tissue and bone can gradually reduce or almost eliminate these deformities in most club feet. Dr. Ponsetti devoted a whole chapter in his book to kinematics and functional anatomy. And in this video, we will be focusing on his admonition to gain a sound understanding of the functional anatomy of the foot. He left us with two very important tools to help us understand the pathoanatomy and the kinematics of the clubfoot deformity. One is this photograph of a dissected club foot from a stillborn baby showing the anatomy of the bones that we cannot normally see on x-ray because the bones are made out of cartilage. The other is this elasticized clubfoot model which demonstrates the kinematics. He ingeniously put elastic bands where the ligaments of the foot are so that we can actually watch the bones move as we manipulate the foot. Principle number one. Almost all the motion of the foot occurs around the talus. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion occur primarily at the ankle joint between the tibia and the talus, with a contribution from the subtalar joint. Pronation and supination occurs through the subtalar joint and talonavicular joint rotating around the talus. This leads directly to principle number two, the calcaneopedis block. With pronation and supination, there is very little movement between the tarsal bones in the midfoot and at the calcaneocuboid joint. These bones move more or less as a unit, or block, called the calcaneopedis block. Using the model, we stabilize the head of the talus and observe the foot rotating around the head of the talus and through the subtalar joint as a unit. The significance of this is that the rear foot can be mobilized and manipulated using the forefoot. And so it is that in the Ponsetti technique, the head of the talus is stabilized and the foot is manipulated into position by abduction pressure on the forefoot. In this example, we see that adduction pressure on the forefoot results in the heel going into varus, and abduction pressure results in the heel going into valgus, demonstrating movement of the calcaneus using the forefoot as the motor. Principle number three is that all the correction, apart from cavus, are corrected simultaneously by abduction of the foot around the talus. This occurs because of the specific kinematics of the subtalar joint, which we will now evaluate. The subtalar joint is one of the most complex joints in the body. Its motion is described as supination and pronation, complex motions occurring simultaneously in multiple planes. By convention, the reference for describing these motions is the plantar and anterior surface of the calcaneus. Supination is the combination of adduction, inversion, and plantar flexion. The heel goes into varus. Pronation is the combination of abduction, eversion, and extension, more commonly referred to as dorsiflexion. The heel goes into valgus. In its deformed position, Clubfoot deformity is in the maximum position of supination of the subtalar joint, 
with the foot adducted, inverted, and plantar flexed, and with the heel in varus. There is also cavus of the forefoot with reference to the rear foot. In its corrected position, the foot is now in maximum pronation, with the foot abducted, everted, and dorsiflexed, and with the heel now in valgus. Principle number four is that the foot is corrected by allowing the tarsal bones to follow the normal kinematics of the subtalar and talonavicular joint. Like a train following the tracks, the correction will occur if the subtalar and talonavicular joints are allowed to move naturally. At this point I need to tell the story as to how Dr. Ponsetti came to understand the kinematics of the tarsal bones. He was gifted in being able to speak and read several languages, and he read the European literature. He read the work of Dr. Louis Farboff from Paris in a document entitled Précis et de Manuel Operatoire, written in 1872, in which the motions of the subtalar joint are described. He then read a 1961 thesis by Hewson in Dutch, which showed that all the motions of the subtalar joint occur simultaneously, and that blocking motion in one plane blocks motions in the other planes. Hewson suggested that these motions are a closed kinematic chain. Farabuff likened the motions of the subtalar joint to a boat going up and down a wave. The boat has to simultaneously pitch, yaw, and roll. These motions cannot be separated from one another. Likewise, the individual components of pronation and supination cannot be separated from one another, but occur simultaneously. In normal stance, the subtalar joint is pronated. The foot is abducted, everted, and dorsiflexed. The heel is in valgus. When the subject rises to tiptoes, plantar flexion occurs. Because plantar flexion is kinematically coupled to inversion and adduction, these motions must occur in an obligatory way, and the heel moves into varus. This is a common clinical test for flexible flat foot, demonstrating that the subtalar joint is mobile. Let us now use the model to validate these principles. I will be using the word kinematic coupling to show the relationship between the motions, using abduction as the reference, since this is the mechanism of correction of a club foot. Firstly, inversion and eversion are kinematically coupled to abduction. The first maneuver in Ponsetti clubfoot correction is elevation of the first ray to correct the cavus. In this maneuver, the apparent supination of the foot seems to be exaggerated. In this photograph of a case of Dr. Ponsetti after the first cast, the foot seems almost to be on its side. It seems intuitive to pronate the foot in order to bring it into plantigrade position. And this, in fact, is what we did prior to adopting the Ponsetti technique. Let us observe what happens with inversion as the foot is abducted around the head of the talus. Elevation of the first ray is maintained. As the foot abducts, the inversion spontaneously everts and the foot becomes plantigrade. This is a time-lapse 3D CT study of an adult foot going from supination to pronation. Note the spontaneous correction of inversion to eversion and back again. The principle learned from this is that eversion is kinematically coupled to abduction and the foot is never pronated. Pronation of the foot will only increase the cavus deformity. Next, heel varus and abduction is kinematically coupled. Looking at the model from behind, as the foot is abducted around the head of the talus, eversion spontaneously occurs, and the heel moves from varus to valgus. As we do this maneuver, note the lateral tether, which is the ligamentous attachment between the fibula and the calcaneus. The lateral tether spontaneously stretches with the maneuver. Next, dorsiflexion of the calcaneus through the subtalar joint and abduction are kinematically coupled. The final cast before tenotomy in the Ponsetti technique is to 50 degrees of abduction, and the cast after tenotomy should be in 70 degrees of abduction. 
This photograph of one of Dr. Ponsetti's cases after tenotomy shows the fully abducted position of the foot. A frequently asked question is why is so much abduction necessary? And a frequent mistake in Ponsetti clubfoot treatment is not abducting the foot enough. This is a video of a normal newborn showing that normal abduction of the foot is to 70 degrees or more. This is the full range of abduction of the foot. The principle in achieving 70 degrees of abduction is simply to take the subtalar joint to its fully corrected extreme range of motion. But full abduction of the foot also accomplishes several important corrections. Number one, the anterior process of the calcaneus comes out from underneath the talus. Number two, the anterior process of the calcaneus dorsiflexes into the sinus tarsi. Number three, dorsiflexion of the subtalar joint is achieved by stretching the posterior capsule. And number four, the lateral tether is stretched. Let us now demonstrate this with the model, showing that abduction of the foot is kinematically coupled to dorsiflexion of the calcaneus. As the foot abducts, the calcaneus rotates out from under the talus. Note the dorsiflexion of the calcaneus occurring at the extreme range of abduction. Dorsiflexion does not occur significantly through mid-range, but will occur once the calcaneus has come out from under the talus and is free to move upward into the sinus tarsi. Stopping abduction short of full abduction limits the amount of dorsiflexion that the calcaneus can undergo. Note also the stretching of the lateral tether. In this 3D CT of a normal adult foot, we see the calcaneus coming out from under the talus, the anterior process extending into the sinus tarsi, and the calcaneus dorsiflexing. At the end of casting, because of this particular fact, the foot is almost always plantigrade, and it's tempting then not to do an Achilles tenotomy. But an Achilles tenotomy is very necessary to be done in order to gain the normal dorsiflexion now through the ankle joint. So abduction of the foot gains dorsiflexion through the subtalar joint, and tenotomy will gain dorsiflexion through the ankle joint to complete the correction. Dr. Ponsetti liked to put his thumb on the head of the talus in such a way as to feel the anterior process of the calcaneus coming up to touch the undersurface of the thumb. When he felt the calcaneus entering the sinus tarsi and contacting his thumb, he was content that full abduction had been achieved and it was time for tenotomy. Principle number five, therefore, is that full abduction of the foot is necessary to effectively treat clubfoot deformity. The tarsal bones must be allowed unimpeded movements and great care must be made never to apply any pressure over the calcaneus to block its motion. So now we've examined why the Ponsetti technique works. It works because of kinematic coupling of the tarsal bones of the foot and using the forefoot to motor the rear foot through the phases of correction. Let's have a look now at why the old system failed. Certainly when I was a younger orthopedic surgeon, I was taught to manipulate this foot in three different sequences. Firstly, to abduct the foot, then to correct the heel varus, and then to dorsiflex the foot. In other words, to break down these motions into three different segments. And what we found was we could seldom correct the foot fully, and we had to go to surgical treatment. We never abducted the foot beyond neutral, really. Dr. Ponsetti referred to this as Kite's mistake, which was to block the movement of the calcaneus. Because in order to do the manipulations I've just described, one has to hold the calcaneus to manipulate the forefoot. So let's do this as an experiment. I will now hold the clubfoot model the way I used to hold the club feet when I corrected them. I will first abduct the forefoot, then evert the heel, and then dorsiflex. And let's have a look at where the correction is happening. The calcaneus is held, the forefoot is abducted, the heel is brought into varus. And what we can see is that we're getting a spurious correction through the mid-tarsal joints. We are creating a secondary deformity in order to correct the primary deformity. 
and that's because we haven't allowed the subtalar joint to follow its normal trajectory and the calcaneus has not come out from underneath the talus. So the effectiveness of the Ponsetti technique has to do with Dr. Ponsetti's understanding of the normal kinematics of the tarsal bones of the foot and the subtalar joint, taking advantage of them in order to gain the correction. And this was a completely different viewpoint than we had had prior to 1996 when he published his book. And it's to him goes a lot of credit for opening up this particular bit of knowledge for us so we can now correct baby's feet without surgical intervention. I have found as I've taught the Ponsetti technique over the years, it's this demonstration of the kinematics using this elastic foot model that has allowed many practitioners to understand finally why the Ponsetti method works. Not just that it works through a formula, but this is why it works. And we can gain an impression of what's happening in these little bones by feeling them through the skin. I have always thought of Dr. Ponsetti as the Michelangelo of the clubfoot world. Such a great artist, such a great technician in correcting club feet. It was Michelangelo who, looking at a block of marble, said, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. He could see inside the block of marble the shape that he wanted to set free. And so it is, Dr. Ponsetti could see the movements of all the tarsal bones of the foot and simply manipulated the foot to set them free from their bondage. And so it is, if we understand how the tarsal bones move and work, if we can see them with our mind's eye using this model, then we will understand how the correction is achieved and when we have a most perfect correction of the club foot. Let us review the important principles of kinematics of the tarsal bones. Number one, the calcaneopedis block. All the bones of the foot move around the talus as a unit with very little movement between them. This allows us to use the forefoot to motor the rear foot in the corrective maneuvers. Number two, the various complex movements of the tarsal bones and subtalar joint occur simultaneously and are kinematically coupled. We use abduction of the foot to drive the other components to their corrected position. Number three, correction of the clubfoot deformity follows the normal kinematics of the subtalar joint, from supination to pronation. The calcaneus must not be blocked from its normal motion. Number four, it is necessary to obtain maximal abduction of the foot in order to obtain full eversion and dorsiflexion of the calcaneus. On behalf of the Global Clubfoot Initiative, I hope you've enjoyed this video and come to understand a little bit more about the dynamic processes that allow us to correct baby's feet when they have clubfoot deformity. Music